Welcome to the official tennis.com podcast featuring professional coach and community leader, Kamal Murray. Welcome to the tennis.com podcast. I am your host, Kamal Murray, and we are on today with Dr. Carl Goodman. This is a, a man who is an HBCU tennis legend. He's one of the guys that I'm forever grateful for because he gave me an opportunity to play uh, college tennis on a great team in a great environment with a lot of love. And coming from where I came from, um, you know, that's what I needed to get to and through college. Is somebody that was going to make sure I was at study hall, wake me up in the morning, hold me accountable, but do it with, uh, with some genuine love and authenticity. So welcome, Dr. Carl Goodman, to the show. Thank you, Kamal. Appreciate it. Appreciate the invite. <laughs> so you were like famous back when I was in, in high school. You were famous for finding diamonds in a rock. First of all, FAMU tennis had a lot of sort of prestige because Althea Gibson went there. Did Althea's attending there make it easy for you to recruit or how much did her legacy still live on back in that 98 to 2000 era? Well, again, when you look at Althea Gibson, of course, being really the first black female tennis player to make it uh, on the professional level, um, the fact that you know she came to, to Florida and got her degree was definitely something that you can always sell. Um, but again, the fact that you know she is a female uh, really trying to get the uh, male guys to, and, you know, the males to come to the, you know, some of the family, it was definitely something a little, little more, more challenging uh, because um, the fact that, you know, I think um, because the numbers of African-American male tennis players uh, was, was low and the will always continue to be low because of just of the other sports that are out there like football and basketball, but really uh, trying to really sell them to Florida and University. So definitely having Althea Gibson is definitely always has been a feather in our cap. Um, but definitely saying that, you know, when we're recruiting wise, that we were trying to find the next uh, male, Althea Gibson, to possibly come from Florida a &M. And so that's how we kind of sell, sold our, our way in terms of trying to get the uh, African-American males to come to Florida a University. So you talk about trying to sell HBCU tennis to tennis players. I remember my recruiting visit. I think you thought you were slick. You invited me down during homecoming, showed me around the set. Took me to phase one, you know, the apartment dorms, even though I didn't get the chance to stay there. So, <laughs> that's kind of like an HBCU trick, right? Where I think the advantage HBCUs have over PWIs is homecoming. And I remember all five or six of us were down there. You're like, see guys, this is every Friday on our campus. <laughs> How many other guys fell for that? <laughs> well, let me, let me first say with you, uh, Maybe your application to those particular doors got lost. So it wasn't my fault, right? <laughs> but I sure didn't end up in the apartment door the first year. Man, well, you, I was like, no, nah, when I checked in, I was like, no, nah, I'm not supposed to be in uh, this dorm. I'm supposed to be down the hill in the two bedroom with the roommate. I think you got mine lost with the air conditioning. I think my, my application is like, y'all got a mistake yet. <laughs> hey, well, well, you know me. Uh, one of the things that we always did at, at FAMU was, we wanted to make sure our, our our team was together. And so maybe you were supposed to be going down there, but the other kids probably couldn't go down there. So you had no choice but to go where everybody else was at. <laughs> so that's so that was part of our that's part of the, our, our our recruiting too, really was uh that close niche family that we had. And and definitely like when you mentioned family, I mean really family is, you know, definitely right now uh is definitely the number one HBCU, um, public HBCU in, in the country right now. And so it, it was not hard to sell FAMU because, I mean, really a lot of people, uh, once you really step foot in Tallahassee, you step foot on that great historical campus at Florida a University, it was an easy sell. I mean, in terms of just, you know, we talk about excellence of caring when I was there uh, as an institution. Uh, and the minute anyone walked onto that campus, they really just fell in love with the campus. Um, and, and so with that being the case, I mean, really, it was an easy sell. And so for a lot of our other students, really, the things that we did, in particular, like you mentioned during homecoming, really having our teams come back, our players come back year after year to talk about their stories and about their journeys and having our the current players there listening to them. And again, having a lot of just great individuals who are part of those teams in the past. I mean, again, you can't get nobody easier to sell than that. I mean, just really having that, wanting to be a part of that group and knowing that, you know, there were a lot of students who actually wanted to be a part of, you know, the FAMU tennis and, you know, you know, really 
it was hard because, you know, men's tennis, you only have really six players play. Your team size maybe is around eight or nine players. Um, and so, you know, you, we couldn't get everybody. But for those who were really the chosen ones to come into that university uh, and be a part of the family men's tennis team was just, you know, again, in terms of my years there, which is something that was definitely, definitely, was definitely outstanding and just, you know, memories that I will always take with me. Now, I, I can't attest it. I think every Black player in that era, even still today, looks at FAMU, right? If they don't go to a PWI, they look at FAMU first. And you're right, there were like a chosen few. Um, how did you choose those? Because I remember when we first came, I looked, it was Isaac. No, I, mean, I looked at like our, we were calling ourselves like the Fab Five, right? I was like, oh, how did these guys get here, right? Out of all the talent that was out there, how did you choose those when you're trying to balance the scholarship? Um, you know, and I was looking around like, wow, these dudes can ball. It, even when we came home, coming in the past, dudes, just like, never heard of Tamiron, never heard of BT, right? These guys who I would say probably weren't top 10 USTA, but like could ball and were super tough. So when you looked at like the recruiting aspect, obviously everybody can hit the ball, right? They got to have a grade. But what else did you look at in terms of trying to build a team? Well, uh, yeah, I, I think one for me really was character. Um, really the, as I, as, as you know, uh, when, you know, parents were either coming in or about to drop their, their, uh, you know, their young students off to FAMU, uh, one of the things I would tell every family member, uh, every parent, you know, I really appreciate you raising, you know, your son, um, from infancy to being a, uh, to being a teenager. Um, but it's my job as the coach really to, make that young man from being a, a teenager to being a young man. And, and really just taking my job seriously that, you know, once they came to FAMU, I was expecting two things, that they were going to play some great tennis. They were going to have some character coming out. And then number three, they were going to get their degree. And those are things that I asked for. Um, and then just looking at the players, I mean, really, you know, it just, you know, just, a, a, you know, just, you know, being around these individuals, I mean, there was just something different about each and every one. I mean, again, like, like as you always used to always tell you, again, I don't want 100. I don't want like eight Carls on the team. I need, uh, you know, some of those who are really just, you know, brilliant in terms of in the books, but playing excellent tennis. I need some of those who were like some firecrackers really to get in the team riled up when, you know, people were kind of like, uh, you know, either scared to play or just, you know, things were just kind of like too quiet. And then you had those who really were just, you know, just, I just, you know, they were just like the, the wise men of the team and just making sure that, again, everything was on point, that we, we always making sure that we were checking each other, making sure that, again, they were going to class, they were coming to our practice on time. And then, again, at the end of the day, playing some great tennis. So that's, that's how we kind of looked at things. And so, like, like you said, uh, when you go back and reflect on all the players we've had, um, there's a difference in everybody uh, in terms of who we had. I, I, I would not even say that not one individual is kind of like, like another individual. But the good thing was really when you look at all of our players, uh, I mean, they came from far and wide. I mean, you look at you know, not just from, from down in the state of Florida, but definitely up in the Northeast, you know, the Midwest where you were from in, in Chicago. So we had a lot of good pipelines as far as who we recruited people from. And, and that was really the unique thing that uh, many of the players we had were some of the top players um, UST USTA wise or ATA wise, uh, particularly within their regions, nationally, some were internationally, um, you know, outstanding players. So again, as far as being at FAMU, being down in the state of Florida, uh, you know, being a part of the MEAC, I mean, all those things kind of played in terms of why, you know, Florida a was really what I consider to be really, uh, really to be that pot of gold in terms of why people were, why people were navigating navigating to Florida a &M and really being a part of, of, of the university. I mean, I know that people will always say, well, somewhat it had to be, you know, I had some part of me contributing to it, but really I would say I was never really that part. Really it was the guys who we selected really had the major part in really selling that team and selling the program and selling the university. When you look at the number of people who have gone on to coach after college at a high level, right? So that's attributed to you because I would say, even if you look at pro tennis, right? FAMU men's tennis has had a big impact on men's and women's pro tennis. You got Noah Waterloo who coached Melody, Udan. You got Tron who was a perennial coach at the D1 level. You got Zach who was helping to coach 
Francis TFO for years. You got me and coaching on tour and the women's tour to have those people come from that one university. Like you're thinking about the, the few black people that exist in pro tennis at the coaching level to have three of the four. I mean, there's only four out there, right? You consider Coco Golf's dad and Richard Williams, let's say it's five, right? right. There's only a few out there. I mean, for three of them to come from FAMU, it definitely talks about, A, you picking well, right? Because if someone chooses to stay in coaching after college, then that means that they like loved the sport when they got to that, right? When they got to college, they loved it, right? Or when they got to college, the coach showed them that coaching could be rewarding. So how ironic do you think it is that if you look at pro tennis today, right? Even OG, I remember OG wanted to come to FAMU, right? right. If you, you look at pro tennis today, FAMU has had a big impact on pro tennis and the number of coaches and trainers and stuff that are in it right now. Would you agree? Oh, I, I wholeheartedly agree with you there. I mean, you know, I'm not sure where it came from. I mean, again, I know it's it's something that we brewed up as far as our system that we had, number one. I mean, really, when you look at us as a program that we had, uh, really, it was about the coaching. It was about, you know, really the, the training part of it. It was really about correcting, um, you know, flaws in people's games and, and making them stronger and making sure that uh, even we're looking at even the analytics part about, you know, in terms of, you know, where you should be going attacking individuals who are, you know, maybe stronger at one point of their, you know, early in the set, but then looking at as they get later into the match, where the weaknesses were. So we, we looked at, we had cameras and we were doing all those things that um, I think a lot of other programs were doing, but like you said, um, it, it is definitely um, a pleasure just to, you know, now that I'm done from, you know, college in terms of coaching college tennis to see where our players are. I mean, you mentioned um, definitely Noel and you mentioned um, definitely Zach um, Everden, but we got, a, we got a whole bunch of other coaches around the country. I mean, who are coaching junior tennis right now from, you know, from Frank yeah. Green to, you know, from, from John or Ali down in Orlando uh, to all the guys from Salif and uh, Lee Van Clark. Um, in Atlanta, we got people from oh, all over, yeah, people all over in Texas, all over. I mean, so again, I mean, it's just a, a legacy in terms of what you all, I mean, really, like you said, uh, it's unfortunate that family lost this men's tennis team. But again, as far as the legacy in terms of, like you said, I mean, what the men's tennis team has done uh, is just tremendous, not just in terms of the sport of tennis, but also in terms of just, you know, how these, some of these individuals really have gone on and taken tennis uh, use tennis as a means of really getting a degree and how they're living really productive lives and raising families and things like that. It's just tremendous. And so when you mentioned about just the tennis and the impact we've had on tennis, uh, really, I think it's really part of really just, you know, coming to a program where we talked about really like legacy and, and really looking at, you know, where you're having your mark in tennis. So yeah, having on the collegiate level is definitely is great. But now raising that new group of um, outstanding um, of tennis players who are, who are aspiring to come into college. And then, like you said, what you all doing and going even a step further um, on the pro level is just amazing in terms of what we've done. So when you look at just the legacy, I mean, really, again, it's, it's just how you all took something, ran with it, and, and took it to another level. Now, you talked about, you mentioned, which is sad, right? You mentioned, because you think about all the good coaches that are out there right now, from Fungwa to Isaac, Tron to... Uh, Larry Thompson to no to Frank Green right in Philly doing it. Think about all those coaches right now that are touching these kids and responsible for the next generation and for their school to not have a program, right? Talk about the challenge in on the men's side of men's tennis, and this is almost every male tennis program at HBCU, is year to year, right? You never know based on budget if you're going to get cut, right? Um, Talk about how, you know, you obviously were a significant role at the pharmacy school, assistant dean for the graduate studies at the College of Pharmacy. So you always had another job, but still did the coaching as a passion, right? So you weren't necessarily insecure about your job every year, but the program and the students and how hard it is to recruit. Tell me exactly how much does it cost to run a men's tennis program? And is it a situation where we really should be every year nervous about our existence? Um, at this point in time, and unfortunately I would say yes. Uh, if you were to talk to many uh, male coaches, 
that are, I mean, when coaches are coaching uh, male tennis teams, uh, collegiate tennis teams. I mean, it, it definitely is there. I mean, when you look at, you know, all sports on the NCA side, particularly at colleges, I mean, it's, 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 it's a business at the end of the day. And so when you have a sport like tennis, really, where, I mean, to me, I mean, it's, it doesn't take that much to really run a program. But again, you definitely don't want to run a program like we had in terms of on a shoestring budget, because it, it does take uh, an opportunity to really to have your players travel around to different tournaments. Uh, you definitely want to have, you know, provide at least the very essentials for your players in terms of, you know, a nice uniform, nice warm up suit or nice, you know, nice clothes and uh, workout clothes and, and shoes and strings and, and rackets. So those, all those things do cost money. Um, but again, I mean, really, it's, it's the investment in terms of uh, really most of the universities. Um, tennis is one of those sports, again, as, as you know, I mean, it's a, it's a game for life. Uh, and not only you can play it for a lifetime, but also to me, it, it, treat, it provides you with a lot of really life uh, lessons that you have in terms of just the adversity uh, when you're down and how you pick yourself back up in the middle of a set and then how you, how you, how you can win at the end. And you know, as I always say, as you remember, it, it, tennis is all about really two, two points the last two points. You can go, uh, you can win the first set and lose the second set. You can go all the way down to that third set. And then at the end of the tiebreaker, once you get into that tiebreaker, whoever won those last two points won the match. And so really when you look at just tennis overall, I mean, that's where, that's where we are. But, but to address your question in terms of really, um, you know, in terms of support for at, at most colleges, uh, really it, it requires a little bit more, uh, you know, being a little bit more creative in terms of the funding. Um, I, I know where, where we were, I mean, really, you know, we had an individual really who thought that, um, you know, because, uh, you know, it was a period of time where, you know, most sports have like ups and downs and we were at a point where, uh, we were kind of like rebuilding as, as you know, at family, we were always saying that again, we don't rebuild, we reload. Well, unfortunately, uh, it came a time where, you know, over 20 something years that we had to uh, rebuild. And so, um, as opposed to taking our past history into account. Uh, you know, they had to look to, um, to remove a program. And unfortunately uh, for most um, universities and particularly on the D1 side, uh, really those minor sports like tennis um, or golf, men's tennis or men's golf, or sometimes the, um, some of the track teams, either the cross country teams are the ones that normally are being eliminated. And for us, um, basically, unfortunately for us, I mean, we had our, our men's tennis team uh, was really removed. Um, as you know, I mean, basically the university tried to do that about on, on three occasions uh, and on the two occasions, the first two, uh, you know, we did everything we could do in terms of trying to uh, make sure that the university was aware of, you know, why tennis was important and our legacy and then the things that we've done as far as our graduation rates and having um, for almost maybe over like eight, nine, 10 years, having the highest GPA of all the athletic programs that we had. So just telling that again, there was a, you know, an importance of why. And then like you were mentioning earlier, I mean, having a team really of just African-American player, African-American men uh, players, you just don't see that. Uh, graduating on time, graduating uh, with a degree um, and having an impact in, in their chosen fields, either in tennis or wherever they're doing, um, says a lot. Um, but again, I mean, for us, you know, it, it happened two times. And I, as I told many people that if it happens the third time, uh, I'm not going to fight out. I'll, I'll let it go and let, let somebody else pick up that mantle and, and do that. And, and that's kind of what happened um, at, you know, at FAMU. But again, across the country, uh, it is a major problem uh, in terms of just the funding aspects of, of collegiate sports. And that's where, again, I mean, if you don't have that good donor or if you don't have that good private, uh, you know, somebody's really going to help the programs out, um, you know, you know, again, tennis will always be one of those minor sports. Uh, it's not a major sport considered in terms of fundraising or, you know, really where you're creating dollars in terms of revenue from, you know, attendance and things like that. And so really it's tough in this day and time. I think it's much tougher than it was, again, like I said, the previous two times when I know when they had tried to remove our tennis team. So you talk about, um, I know you're bad with dates and you're bad with names. you always been bad with dates and bad with names. <laughs> but I know you remember the year 2000 because a lot of people don't know that that was the first HBCU team to be top 40 in the country. 
the top 50. <laughs> top 50 in the country? Yeah. Went to the NCAA tournament. Mm-hmm. Lost to UF. Right. Should have won, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us about that 2010. Because you know, we, we feel like we made family. We were, I mean, we was, it's just, man, that 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 group of guys, Jerry, I mean, it was like off the chain back in the day. The personalities. I don't know how you did it because everybody on the team was the man where they came from. Right. Everybody was like, probably could have played in the top three, but somebody had to eat it, play down low. Uh, everybody was crazy. Everybody took a whole lot of management. Tell us about that 2000 team because you know a lot of people don't really know. I think about HBCU tennis, they think of it like low level tennis. But I think at that time, we had FAMU, Hampton were like super strong. South Carolina State was super strong. Norfolk, Norfolk State was starting to get big. But that FAMU team really, I mean, if you think about it, Georgia State, Georgia Southern, FSU, like all those teams that came down to Florida on their spring break and would insult us by playing FSU, Florida State in the morning and coming and playing us in the afternoon, thinking it was a cupcake. Right. <laughs> And they left mad. <laughs> that was about that year. <laughs> no, that was definitely a a, a very memorable year. Uh, like you said, uh, I mean, I, I think one of the one of the good things we said in terms of being bad with names, you know, I called everybody champ, right? <laughs> 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 so everybody was a champ. <laughs> but but no, uh, but that year was definitely something special because, like you said, I mean, really the year before. So that year, actually, we had what four guys or five guys. Who were all uh, who are all actually sophomores? So you and all the guys were like all sophomores, but the year before that one was uh, actually the most challenging year because I mean, like you said, I mean, really having people who had huge egos, uh, who were like you know the man from where they came from, and really is just saying that again in terms of tennis and in particularly collegiate. That's the most important thing about collegiate tennis compared to just tennis but you would play normally uh again with the ata or the uh, usta and all those things tournament wise that it's a team sport and that we were always saying that again there's no i in team uh that again collectively somebody has to take the back seat because there's only one player who's going to be playing number one uh and then after that really it's, it's about really this uh the, the give and take and and you know at least uh for your all's freshman year and even going to your sophomore year that uh, as I told y'all, y'all were track stars before y'all were tennis players. So y'all did a lot of running <laughs> just to get everybody right, number one. <laughs> but, but really to see what you all did, you know, you all's freshman year. I mean, I mean, just look at you. I mean, you had, uh, who was it? You, uh, Gary, Isaac, it was uh, uh, Lennon, Kareem. So that was the five freshmen you all had at that, that year. I knew. Then, yeah, so it oh. was, just, yeah. So no add, came then, add, add the guys who was already there. Yeah, Malcolm, right, Mighty, right. BT, right, right. <laughs> and, and John Richards and, and John Richards as well. So, I mean, yeah, so you had all the all you guys there. So the good thing was you all as 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 freshmen the year before, really getting all your getting all that energy out of you <laughs> that was unwanted <laughs> energy and getting y'all really your mindset focused, but then really having those older guys like you just mentioned with VT and, and, and John Richards really being seniors at that time. Uh, and then you, you add in Malcolm and you add in, uh, you know, all the other players who were there. I mean, it really provided just a unique opportunity. And then you, you got to give credit to also really uh, Larry Thompson, because I mean, I mean, besides all the hard work that you guys were doing, uh, really just the amount of fun going to these road trips or during practice or after practice, <laughs> I mean, we really had to chase you guys off the deck on court every day. It was like, hey, practice is over. Go home. And y'all just wouldn't <laughs> want to go home. And so that was just like a memorable year. And so when you look at this, that year in 2000, uh, going from 19, what, what uh, going for that year of 2000, 1999 to 2000, going to that spring semester, uh, it was just really amazing to see everything start to click. Uh, number one, in terms of, you know, really the pairing of um, each other in terms of the doubles teams that we had. Uh, and then really seeing just all of the, um, you know, just when you looked at your, 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 your challenge matches that you all had, 
I mean, that was like, whoa. I mean, just like, hey, that's just some amazing tennis. I mean, forget the dad gonna play in the official matches. Like, hey, look at our dad match we got during the uh during just the while we're practicing and everything like that. So those that competition that you all had, uh, and that level of respect really is, is the most important thing that again, at the end of the day, uh, really learning how to respect each other. And that as we always said again, I mean, you do all you can do that that day. And if it wasn't your day, then again, tomorrow, you live for tomorrow. And hey. Tomorrow you got another opportunity, and I really you all taking that opportunity really every each and every day, the one play the best tennis that you can. Really, just that camaraderie that you all had again, and I really I think the most important thing about family really in terms of family tennis really was just that family atmosphere that we had. So like when we talked about really coming bringing people back, um, I mean I know you guys normally are speaking to each other to the end of time, and I think every team every year. From the minute that I was there, you know, back in the, uh, in the in the late '80s, going up until really, um, you know, into the 2020s, uh, really was just overly amazing in terms of what you all have done. And so, really, it's just—I mean, really, it's just you know, you all did it. And really, to see uh, putting the university on that level in terms of hey, that we finally made, we finally broke through as a legitimate top, you know, 75 Division One team. Uh, was just truly amazing. And then all the respect that you all get garnered from just the, the number of wins that you had. And like you said, some teams kind of, uh, you know, took us for, you know, no, for, uh, you know, for, you know, a second team and said, okay, well, we want to do this because they were up North or they were in the Midwest, didn't know anything about, you know, coming down to um, Florida. And at that time, you know, we didn't have no really no major, major internet stuff going on where you had rankings and all those other things. So yeah, we, we stuck on a lot of good teams that were out there, but again, not so much sneaking up on them. Because, I mean, y'all were legit. I mean, y'all were really a legitimate team in terms of what y'all done. Uh, and so, hey, I mean, <laughs> the numbers and, and the facts and uh, all the accolades, you know, goes out to all your stuff, the hard work that you all put in. I remember, man, we'd be there. We'd line up against the other team. And Jerry would point, like, oh, I got you. Point to the other team. <laughs> Dude on the team was like, who am I? Oh, I got to play him? Oh, him? Oh, I got to play him? Oh, no, I, I got I got mine, boys. Right? That's <laughs> It was just like stuff that you would never see in tennis ever before. And dudes were like, are these dudes serious? Y'all sitting there talking about one down boys? It's like, I got mine. You got yours? I got mine. Don't worry about him. I got him. I mean, that was just like, that's what tennis really should be. Right. Um, but when you think about the programs we had to battle against, you think about the legendary coaches, you know, in and around black tennis, Coach Screen at Hampton. I mean, Besides yourself, Coach Green helped a lot of black dudes out. Was one of the guys that was like first to recruit in Ashley down to the U.S. Virgin Islands. Mm -hmm. uh, Coach Strickland, Jeff Conyers, Alan Green. Which of those four were like your biggest nemesis? I know like every year, fam, you Hampton president, you'd have a bet against each other about who was going to win. Right. Uh, which one of those four was probably your biggest nemesis? No, def definitely, uh, definitely Dr. Screen. I mean, really, uh, even though Dr. Screen had, you know, during the times that we were there, uh, really his team is really all international guys from South America. He may have had, uh, you know, one one player or two from uh, really from definitely from um, from from Africa. Yeah, I think during the time I was there, he may have had maybe like uh, maybe like two or three kids uh, who were maybe from from the states. But definitely, uh, really, um, you know, because there's, there's always, you know, as, as you know, in terms of coaching tennis and that seeing tennis players, there's a different style between, you know, really American tennis versus international tennis. And depending on where the countries are from, uh, there's definitely a different style of play that they have. And so really, uh, you know, really, he kind of really upped our game because, I mean, he was definitely the, uh, he was definitely, at the time, he was the GOAT. I mean, everybody wanted to be him. Everybody wanted to be Hampton. And uh, really, it came a point in time where, uh, you know, again, I mean, the, the, the battles that we've had with Hampton at, during those times, I mean, really was just, it was some amazing tennis that, I mean, I think everybody would really just be, uh, we talk about really like some of these, these um, competitive tennis teams out there that are going on right now, you would really want to buy, really pay like $5, get a cup of, pop, get up some popcorn, get up, get some soda pop and watch the tennis out there because it was some amazing stuff going on during those days. So definitely Dr. Screen, definitely um, in terms of his legacy, him being a trailblazer um, um, in terms of, you know, black college tennis, Hampton University, definitely got to give him all of his mad respect and all the players who played for him. And I remember I tripped a fan to Hampton during the conference 
and you would not you would not let us leave the hotel. And it wasn't even COVID times. They had the prettiest <laughs> girls in Hampton. And every time we go to Hampton, you would not, you make us stay in a hotel way far away from campus. That was my biggest disappointment. <laughs> biggest disappointment. <laughs> Oh man, you had to you had the shackles on us, man. We could not do anything. Again, Kamal, you know how y'all had too much dagger energy back then, man. So my <laughs> goal was really y'all playing tennis first. I don't give a heck about what's going on. Hey, we're coming down here to play tennis or going up there to play tennis. And that's all y'all gonna do. After tennis season was over, hey, y'all can do whatever y'all want to do during that point in time. So again, you talk about being on the house arrest or COVID. <laughs> hey, y'all had all that and then so. <laughs> 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 man well one of the things that i think um the challenge of hbcu men's and women's tennis now is just a consistent recruiting right and you think about all the good black former hbcu tennis players who are good coaches in these markets now but unable to promise their athletes that at the end of this role it's going to be a pot of gold right because who knows what HBCU programs are still around in the next 10 years. Like if I'm on the court with a seven, eight year old, I can't promise them that Howard tennis will be around, that FAMU tennis will still be around. What do you think we need to do globally to sort of help save HBCU tennis, right? Because even during the pandemic, you saw um, predominantly white institutions get rid of tennis programs, mm -hmm. right? And when I think about the black tennis player, I think that they're always the late starter or always financially restricted in the juniors, which means they cannot go to Super Nats, Easter Bowl, level two, level three, all these tournaments where you just accumulate points so you can hit the computer and get a high ranking, right? Basically buy some points. Um, and the, the kid that go, the black kid, right? You know, who starts late, but then talent is not reflective of their ranking, mm -hmm. right? How do we sell tennis at the junior level if we can't promise them a scholarship at the top level because they might not get recruited by the PWI because the ranking ain't there, right? So if I'm at North Carolina, I'm looking at the top top 100 list and I'm sending a letter to every kid in the top 100, right? And so you might miss an Isaac, you know what I mean? You might miss a Noah Waterloo. You might miss a Frank Green. You might miss some of those guys, you know what I mean? How, how do we continue to even, you know, promote the sport to young kids though? Again, I, I think number one, it's 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 really the networking. Um, like you just said, I mean, of course, most people are looking at those top lists as far as you know, young players who are coming up. Um, but really, I mean, like you said, I mean, you have some players who just did not have the ability to to travel or to get into these tournaments, and that's where uh, again, I've been so fortunate in terms of just meeting a lot of great people where they would say, "Hey, let me tell you, this particular player right here, they may not got it." the all as far as the funding is concerned because tennis is, is one of those sports where you know it does it does require some some funding it requires money to travel and all those things and so really looking for not so much that diamond in the rough but more so like you said that late bloomer um and so when you identify a player like that i mean really that's where um and put them into a system where they are around a bunch of other great players and and again and, and the training is there um, making sure that you're eating right and all those things, you're sleeping well, you're you're going, I mean, because it's college tennis, you, you're getting your, you're going to classes in the morning. Um, those are things that, you, that you're looking for. And so again, in terms of where we are right now, as far as coaches are concerned, um, really it's, you know, it, it's, it's no other, it's no, it's not like any other year. I mean, it's really, it's beating the pavements. It's really calling around. It's, it's making those contacts. It's, um, you know, sending out the letters to um, like anybody else will be doing. Hey, I mean, uh, you know, out, if sending out to 100, you, you may not see that some of these kids may not, you feel they may not be uh, attracted to your program. But again, if you don't send a letter out, <laughs> you never know. And so again, I mean, again, at the end of the day, not everybody, I mean, for tennis, like any other sport, like right now you're seeing like in football, uh, again, only 11 players play football. And some football teams have like 60, 70, 80 players. And they may not get a chance to play until like either their second or their third year. And some players say, I, I want to play now. And so, again, I mean, if you got six scholarships or you got four and a half scholarships, um, again, they may only get a half here or a quarter there. They may come to another team and get a, uh, and get a full ride. 
And so that's where, again, teams really have to be a little bit more creative in terms of selling their programs. And so, yeah, I mean, is it tough? I can tell you it is, it is definitely tough in terms of really trying to really get those individuals to come to your program. But then also you got to look at other players. I mean, again, like, like I can remember you like yourself, man, coming out, I mean, yeah, athletically and all that good stuff. But you're, you're a pretty smart guy, though. So, I mean, you're probably one of the smartest guys we have on the team uh, coming into the university. So, I mean, as far as scholarships were concerned um, on the academic side, uh, what's the other thing that, I mean, again, you really got to have some really some players who really who are definitely, you know, academically solid. Uh, really where, uh, again, I mean, really you couldn't, you know, you may not have enough of the, the, the athletic scholarships, but you can do the matching with the athletic and the academics. And so that's really where, you know, again, in terms of being creative. Again, some institutions, they may not have the funding for uh, on the academic side in terms of providing scholarships. And definitely some of the HBCUs uh, will have some limitations on the, um, on, the, on the athletic scholarship side. But again, to me, like you said, the question really is how can we, increase the number of HBCUs playing, uh, at least in terms of having tennis teams, really, I think, I think really it, it, it involves really the, the college presidents uh, and really saying that, um, again, I mean, not everybody's going to get an opportunity to, to go into the pros and particularly look at on the D2 side, uh, really you got to be something really exceptional to be trying to go into the professional levels. And so what I'm looking at, you know, again, I mean, you got these, these other sports really where I mean, you can make some major impact on, on certain students' lives in terms of coming to some of these programs and particularly on, the, on men's tennis. And so I would say like really having a lot of these individuals, either the board of trustees, um, presidents, uh, athletic directors, really kind of to kind of take a second look at their programs and, and really their requirements in terms of what's needed to have some of these programs come back uh, on the men's side. Um, definitely. I mean, again, I mean, there are things that I think I know that you and others are doing right now. You're looking, trying to support some programs uh, to get them to come back uh, again, because, again, this is a sport that, as you know, I um, mean, has made a major impact on my life. I know it has a major impact on your lives. And so, again, I think there are a lot of individuals who really want to see at least um, tennis stay around for a longer period of time and particularly at our HBCUs, which are definitely more valuable at this point in time, when we just look at in terms of what they do for uh, a lot of our students who are, who are African-American. And then the last thing I would like to say, really, when you talk about just HBCUs, I mean, you know that in this day and time, really, the, um, the amount of African-American males um, going to college, really, it's, it's, it's at a dismal shape right now. And so that's the reason why we look at just you know, college tennis, and particularly um, at an HBCU, um, to attract um, an African-American male to play college tennis, where you're talking about that discipline and, and staying, you know, and using their, uh, using their mind, not just on the tennis court, but also in the, in their, in their, um, on the, in the classroom, but also on the court. I mean, those are the things that you're doing right now. And so that's where, you know, if you ask me again, where we are as far as HBCUs is concerned and why it's so important, really, when we talk about really trying to recruit African-American males. So you start a new chapter. Provost at Bowie State, not known as the tennis powerhouse like we had at FAMU. You're not coaching there, but I know you got an interest in seeing the program grow. What do you think, or are you trying to help boost the program at Bowie State? Uh, you know that I get it. It's hard for me to not uh, have my hand or my <laughs> finger into uh, into uh, HBCU tennis. And so definitely I've been speaking with uh, my AD, uh, Clyde Dowdy, who's probably one of just a, an amazing AD that we have here at Bowie State University. Uh, and again, we do have, um, you know, I've also asked them like, uh, hey, what are you going to do about men's tennis? I mean, even if I mean, men's tennis as well as our, our current women's tennis team. So we don't have a men's tennis team. We have a, just a women's tennis team. Um, but we're definitely looking to provide more support to our women's tennis team. Um, I actually, our, our Student Government Association uh, president, uh, Jataya um, Stewart, is, a, is, is, is on a tennis team right now. Um, so it's just like, um, so again, again, tennis players always are doing other things besides just playing tennis. I mean, they're multi-talented. And so um, she's a, just an, an another example of just how talented uh, a tennis, a collegiate tennis player is. But uh, for, from Bowie State University, again, I mean, I'm, I'm asking our, our AD uh, to put more resources into our, our female tennis team right now. 
uh, maybe even possibly consider having a male sentence team some year down 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 the road from right now. So again, I would love to see again, particularly being up here at Bowie State University in the epicenter of the uh, DMV area, the, the, the definitely the Washington DC, the Maryland, uh, Virginia area, that it should be no reason why we are a powerhouse like the others are that are in this area right here. So there's a lot of great tennis going on here um, in Bowie, um, in Bowie, Maryland. Uh, and so I would like to see uh, us having uh, an opportunity to, to do those things as well. As an institution, we, again, we're the oldest HBCU in, in the state of Maryland. Uh, we're the fastest growing institution um, in the state of Maryland. And so why not have a great tennis team like we do have a great football team and a great basketball team, great softball team, great volleyball team, great bowling teams. We've got a lot of great sports going on and we want to make sure that tennis is up there with them as well. Well, good luck. Let me know if you need some players. You know, I every diversity camp I go to, you know, I'm scouting out talented parents always asking me, hey, my kids are junior. Where should I go? Who you know has scholarships? So I'll definitely... Look out for you, Doc Goodman. I, I appreciate the time on behalf of all the males uh, and all the players at FAMU that you helped in the past and gave a shot, you know, not only to be on the tennis team, but a shot at life um, and mentored and, you know, kept, kept your foot on our neck throughout the whole process. <laughs> it really taught us how to be a tough. I remember back when you were like, man, you soft. It was like, <laughs> soft with a capital T. <laughs> Hey, you're not supposed to be saying that stuff on these podcasts. Hey, man. I'm just saying, you know. <laughs> but let me tell you, tennis is one is hand to hand combat, right? It's one on one sport, and so I think that when I think about when I listen to other athletes talk about tennis, that's the part of the game I hear them underestimate the most. Right, is the toughness I take. So even as a coach, right, I can fix any forehand. Well, most forehands, okay. I can fix mostly anything technically, right? But if you soft. I don't know that I can help you. And so as a coach, so so as a coach, that's what I, you know, that's sort of what I value most is just toughness. Right. Uh, and I remember at FAMU, it was like, man, if you weren't tough, you weren't going to survive. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you weren't going to survive four years at that program. So I, I thank you because even in my next chapter, to enter the, the arenas that I've been able to enter in, walking a woman for the first time, not having played pro tennis, walking US Open, not having played pro tennis, walking to the boardrooms, asking people to donate money to my foundation to build the facility. All of that requires a certain level of confidence and toughness that I definitely attribute to my years at FAMU. So I thank you for that on behalf of all the other guys. Uh, I wanna thank you for that. And uh, thanks for coming on the show. This has been a tennis.com podcast with Dr. Carl Goodman. Uh, HBCU coaching legend, uh, a mentor to many, and now the provost at Bowie State. Thanks for coming on. Thank you, Kamal. Wish you the best. <laughs>